These words have left me rearranged And I say hey Stone Kids. This week we're starting our new four week series called Epic. Today we have guest speaker Johnny. Morning, everybody. My name's Johnny. Today we'll be hearing some epic stories from the Old Testament part of the Bible. Are you ready to hear about this week's epic adventure? We're in the book of Exodus. But before we get into any of that, I've got a couple of questions for you. Have you ever had to cross some water? (laughs) 
Lovely jubbly. Have you ever had to climb a mountain? <laughs> Bush. Have you ever had to journey through the wilderness? Beautiful. The people in today's story are called the Israelites, and they had to do all of these things. They wandered through the wilderness for 40 years, they did. And they often felt like they were just walking around in circles, a bit like this geezer over here. So God called their leader, a guy called Moses, to build a tobacco, taboo balibu, oh, a tabernacle. What a strange word that is. Can you say tabernacle? Right kids, I need you to jump up off your seats. And when I count to three, I want you to shout as loud as you possibly can, tabernacle. One, two, three, Tabernacle. You see, a tabernacle was like a big tent, somewhere the Israelites could spend time with God. That's right. All right, Johnny, mate. That was a good old chap. I just overheard you chatting on about some sort of tabernacle, but I'm a little confused off what you said. You said the Israelites could only meet with God in the tabernacle, so. Does that mean that we can only meet with God in the tabernacle? Uh, rude. I just asked you a question, Johnny. Johnny! He's gone off for a little nap. He is always doing that. Sarah, could you help me? Yeah. So, does that mean that we can only meet with God in the tabernacle? So does that mean we can meet with God anywhere? Yeah, we can meet with God anywhere because of what Jesus done on the cross. So it means that we can pray to God anytime that we want to. So that's just talking to God wherever we are. We can read our Bibles at home. We can spend time with God anywhere we want to, at any time we want to, because God's always with us. Well, that's pretty awesome. So, does that mean I can spend time with God? Even when I'm driving the car? Yeah, you can spend time with God in the car if you want. Right, okay. Does that mean I can spend time with God? <sighs> what about in my bedroom? Yeah, you can spend time with God in bed. Okay, what about... What about if I'm out for a walk? Yeah, you can spend time with God when you're out for a walk. Of course you can. That's pretty awesome. I've got one though. Can I spend time with God? What if I'm playing hide and seek? Shh. Yeah, you can spend time with God when you're playing hide and seek. I've got it. Can I spend time with God? What about when I'm in the bathroom? <laughs> yeah, you can spend time with God in the bathroom. That is absolutely awesome. Hi everyone, hope you've had fun this morning. And always remember, it doesn't matter where you are, it doesn't matter what time it is, you can always spend time with God. You don't have to be in a tabernacle like the Israelites. God is always with you and you can always be with him. Hope to see you guys again next week. Bye. Bye.
There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen. The sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come. Fly. to celebrate. 
favorites right here. I got Fernick for the preaching. I got Bethel for worship. I got Judah for his fashion sense and Riverside for community. It's awesome. It's great. I love it. Honey, the pastor said that the church service is going to be in the computer. <laughs> I sure do miss the nursery. You ready for church, honey? All right, let's go. Where, where what was that? I didn't have got the ESV version, the elect version. You better not be preaching from the message. You don't get much of a message from the message. <laughs> hey, son, you're late for church. Sorry, mom. In this church, they better be singing Hillsong Young and Fruit. <laughs> you should see Pastor Terry's tie. Nice tie, Pastor Terry. I wonder if we can request a song. Can we request a worship song? I love the chat. I love it. We're in warfare. We rebuke Satan and the spirit Jezebel. I just saw Brad log on. Have you seen his social media lately? And he's and he's in church. Oh, there are the Smiths. I haven't seen them in like six months. All of a sudden, church is online. They show up. I sure hope the pastor preaches on repentance. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Ah! <laughs> praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. Okay. <laughs> I now baptize you in the name of the Father. <laughs> Guys, this is real here. The baptism. I now baptize you in the name of the okay, Father. No, no, you no. Okay. Okay. Are you gonna... I now baptize you in the name of the <laughs> the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I know how the order. I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son. Come on, Reese. Come on. You can do this.
And I hold true to the one who breaks my fall and lifts me time and time again. Oh my God, so good, you never give up. Good morning everybody and welcome to Cornerstone Church Online. My name is Neil and it's a pleasure to have you join us this morning. In a short while, Andy and Grace will lead us in singing a few songs. We sing songs as part of our worship to God. If you don't know the songs, you don't know the words, then don't worry, the words will pop along the bottom of the screen for you. Remember that this service depends upon the speed of your internet, so if you're ever having any problems or any issues, then just hit the refresh button and hopefully that should sort out all of your problems. Andy and Grace are now going to lead us in a time of worship together. Good morning, Cornerstone Church. It's going to be great to worship with you this morning. Even though we're all separated out in our houses, it's still, still so good. Um, we're going to sing some songs this morning declaring what Jesus has done for us in history 
and in our hearts and in the hearts of those who love him. Lord Jesus, would you be glorified this morning in our living rooms? Would you be lifted up? Would you take centre stage and be enthroned um, in our hearts once again? Would these songs remind us of who you are, of your incredible love, and what that means for those who call you King and call you Saviour? Amen. Amen.
The blazing sun shall pierce the night And I will rise among the saints My gaze transfixed on Jesus'
to redeem us from the pit that we had found in fact thrown ourselves into. And just like that good shepherd, you are the one that leaves the 99 safe in the flock of salvation and goes seeking the one that has wandered off. Thank you, Lord, that we are all part of that one and we are all part of your flock if we trust in you as our good shepherd.
son of good. Even when you as the son of God was called a good teacher, you said the only good comes from the Father above. You're the giver of all good and perfect gifts. Lord, we trust that in your good timings all things will work for your glory for the advancement of your kingdom. Jesus, open our hearts to your word, your good and perfect word as it is preached. Open our hearts to community, even as we are far apart. God, would we still be one, would we still be praying for each other, united in your body. Thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you that you are good. Your steadfast love endures forever, and that means you are never going to let us down, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We worship you. If you are visiting us today for the first time, then an extra special welcome to you. We wish as a church that we could give you a flat white and a donut and a wee bag of welcome, but unfortunately we can't do that until we're back in a building. However, if you are a visitor for the first time and you'd like to find out more information, ask some questions, get to know some people from the church, then you can do that by hitting the connect button at the side of your screen now. You can also give to the church by hitting the give button that will appear in your message feed now. I know that in times of uncertainty that it can be really easy to tighten the purse strings a little bit, but God calls us to hand over control of all things to him, including our finances, so let's do that. Speaking of which, we're going to be taking a special offering for churches in need during COVID, particularly churches from Africa, from India, and from Nepal. Any help that you can give to that would be great. If you do want to give, then you can give via bank transfer to the church, just make sure and mark that as COVID relief, or via the give link that will pop up on the screen now. It'll take you to a giving page and you can select the COVID assist fund from there. We're also excited to announce that we'll have our first ever online evening service this evening from half past seven until half past eight. So if you do have any major technical issues during this morning's service or if something wild happens, then do not worry because you can join us this evening from half past seven to half past eight. You can also join the church on Wednesdays and Sundays um, for a Zoom prayer meeting. If you want to join that Zoom prayer meeting, then you'll get an email with all the information on there. If you don't get an email about the Zoom meeting, then you can talk, contact someone from the church and they'll send it to you. It's on Wednesdays from half past 12 until 1 and on Sundays from half past 8 until 9. Um, the Sunday Zoom prayer meeting has obviously changed because we're having a Sunday evening service this evening. So evening service this evening, half past 7 till half past 8 and then there'll be a prayer meeting from half past eight until nine. Thank you for all your lockdown selfies as well. There are still many of you that haven't sent in a picture, so please, can you do that? That would be great. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Mike, and he's going to introduce Dave Campbell to us. Hey, Hi, Dave and Elaine. Hey, Cornerstone. This is our good friends, Dave and Elaine Campbell, all the way from Canada. Uh, they were supposed to be with us a couple of weeks ago, but unfortunately for lockdown, uh, you guys have not been able to be with us. But for some of our friends here at Cornerstone uh, that don't know you, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourselves, your family, and uh, yeah. Yeah, I am a Canadian by birth. Uh, I went to the United Kingdom to Durham University to do a PhD in the theology department. I wound up planning a church there many moons ago. Elaine was nursing at the local hospital. Uh, we met, I carried her off back to Canada where we planted another congregation and have lived here ever since. Uh, but we've always kept up our contacts in the Northeast uh, and in other parts of England. Um, and now the last several years I've stepped down from pastoring. We travel around the world giving encouragement to churches and leaders and teaching uh, and uh, I'm also writing books and so on. And somewhere in the course of all of that, we reached the highlight of our entire life, which was meeting Mike and Esley. <laughs> and, and we love Cornerstone Church. Oh, we love, oh, we you, love guys. you. He's just about said it all, hasn't he? Didn't well, tell us about your family, Elaine. Okay, so yes, so I am a Geordie originally. <laughs> I've been a Canadian for 37 years now, I guess. 
Um, but yeah, we just, we still just love to come back to the Northeast and especially to Cornerstone. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we, uh, we have a large family. We have eight children and now six grandchildren so far. And uh, yeah, that keep, you know, we still have two kids at home at, in this season and that's keeping us somewhat busy. Yeah. But, uh, really looking forward to the next time we can come. Yeah. So, everybody again. So Absolutely, are so are we. Um, tell us a little bit about what lockdown has been like for you guys, just because uh, you would have been traveling to us here at, at Cornerstone and now you can't. Um, has that just mean, meant you have just been sitting in your lounge uh, watching Netflix or have you been uh, busy? Yeah. Well, it's been different for both of us, actually. Uh, for David, it's meant uh, a real massive increase of stuff online, which has actually been quite fruitful and good. Yeah. Uh, he's written a book uh, in this time period. And um, yeah, so he's been very busy. But for me, it's been uh, much more kind of feeling like going backwards to a place of restriction. Um, because this was, you know, a season where I was now traveling uh, with David as opposed to being at home with the family. So it has felt a bit like going back in time for me. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I'm grateful to the Lord. I'm health, we're all healthy. Um, things aren't so restrictive here as in, uh, you know, we live in a rural area. Um, and so, and now that the summer's here, finally, um, you know, we, we can go out and about a fair bit. Yeah. Um, but we're so looking forward to it being over. We have a little routine. You know, we, we go for, we have a lot more, I have a lot more time to pray, which has been excellent. Um, and uh, we, go out, we take our little flasks of coffee and we go and sit out. Nice. We take our chairs and we sit out. Uh, amongst the trees and, and have our coffee and chat and then um, you know Sad, sadly my barista skills are not up <laughs> to the duff standard but but yeah um, you know the, I do actually go to the grocery store for shopping now because the online thing took so long anyway um, but you know it's um, but can we go to the beach? No, we're not allowed to go to the beach. Are we social distancing? Absolutely, yes. I haven't had to wear a mask so far, but if I had to, I yeah. would have to. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've got some battles to fight, like every other family. Yeah. Um, but we're just grateful that the Lord is keeping us. Yeah. Amen. Us hey, uh, some of the stuff that you have been up to during lockdown. Uh, I know Elaine mentioned a book. You've been doing stuff on Instagram. Um, just, yeah. Tell us about some of those things. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm, I've recorded messages for seven churches, I think seven, including Cornerstone. Uh, and uh, I'm doing regular uh, electronic calls zoom messenger whatever with with leaders in different countries um i'm doing instagram lives uh we're involved with an online teaching portal called theos university uh i've just finished filming a lo long course on the biblical doctrine of the holy spirit for that and i have a second one on the gospel of john coming up in a couple of weeks and um i've done some other stuff for that as well yeah. uh and and i wrote this book titled 10 things that are wrong with the bible and how to fix no, i'm sorry 10 <laughs> things we, that, that's heresy 10 <laughs> things we get wrong about the bible and how to fix them you better edit this part of the <laughs> conversation or else i'll be in big trouble 10 things we get wrong about the bible and uh it should be published in september ish god willing and also i'm working on a revised edition of my uh, guide to Revelation, which is called Mystery Explained, which will be republished in uh, at about the same time frame. So, brilliant. So it's I, I've actually been quite busy. Uh, I'm I'm ready for it to be over, like everybody else. But <laughs> sure. uh, in the time, you know. Yeah. Tell us um, how can we be praying for you um, both? We will be praying for you 
potentially at our Zoom prayer meeting on Sunday night. So how, um, give us one or two things, even maybe three. Well, in, the, in, in the immediate, uh, our daughter Sarah is engaged and married to a young man from uh, the church in Durham that I started all those years ago. And uh, all the logistics of trying to get, to get them, married. All the logistics of trying to get them together in one country and have a wedding and even have the parents mm -hmm. there. So that's, that's, uh, that's a big prayer request for, in that, for us now. And a second request is we have a daughter, Julia, who's been ill and uh, is having medical consultations. And we'd really love for her to be well. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, Sarah and Julia, that's our. You know, somebody said, you're only as happy as your least happy kid. Yes. Yeah, sure. And uh, you think that when your kids get up to 18, you boot them out of the house and then it's happily ever after. But actually, I have you, news work, for you. you worry even more. <laughs> so, These pray, are in the 20s. <laughs> we deeply appreciate prayers for our two daughters. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And having eight children, are you ever happy then? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, people have sort of ask various questions about having a large family. And I say, well, it's not really any different from leading a church it's just yeah. the same thing you know there's always some doing really well there's some that you know are kind of main, maintaining and then there's always one or two that are just you know you're just having to be on your knees over and so uh, that's the way I look at it you know if I'm not if we're not doing it in a church context then we're doing it in a family context so it's just dependent. you just Good. embrace it and <laughs> lastly anything you want to say to us as a church, anything you want to encourage us with? I know we're going to be listening to your sermon this morning on the Holy Spirit. Don't worry, Cornerstone. We haven't gotten the date for Pentecost wrong. It was <laughs> last Sunday when Dave was supposed to preach. We just wanted to rather prioritize the memorial for Lydia. So we are having Pentecost Sunday this Sunday and not last. Um, but Dave, anything you want to encourage us with as a young church? Yeah, we love uh, Cornerstone, obviously, and uh, we, we, uh, there's, God is, is going to do something. Uh, we don't know what he's going to do, but it's going to be a very good thing. And I, I have a sense that you're going through a birth canal transition, if I could use that analogy, into something different and bigger. And so out of the birth pains of the restriction uh, is going to come something very positive that's my sense and we whenever we we are able to come whenever god opens the door we fully expect to witness that in person amen oh, amen be awesome. well thanks so much we wish you were here in per in person yeah but alas we have a video recording of your sermon to us cornerstone church i encourage you to open up your hearts uh open up your bibles um and uh yeah let's see how god leads us this morning thanks dave and elaine it's been wonderful yeah. chatting to you and introducing you to some of our church members this morning god bless you guys and you i hope so to much. see you soon you too Bye. Bye. good morning cornerstone i'm speaking to you this morning from jubilee fellowship in stratford ontario wishing that we were with you in person but that will have to wait for another day but that will come. This is Pentecost Sunday, and uh, what more appropriate text to speak on than Acts chapter 2? So I'd like to read a few verses from the beginning of Acts chapter 2 to kick this off. Now, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. 
And they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others mocking said, They are filled with new wine. And I call this message, The Day Heaven Came to Earth. Now, the Holy Spirit makes His appearance at the very beginning of the Bible. Genesis 1 says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. The Spirit was the creative power by which God began to bring shape and order out of the primeval chaos. The Son is the agent by which God created the world, Colossians tells us, but the Holy Spirit is the agent by which God gave its shape and form. And the work of the Spirit then continues in Genesis as God speaks words into the creation, and out of that comes the world pictured in Genesis 1, culminating in the creation of humankind. Then the Lord formed the man of dust from the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath, or ruach, which is the word for spirit, of life, and man became a living creature, Genesis 2 and 7. Psalm 104 says uh, of the animals in the creation, when you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. The Holy Spirit has a continuous creative role in the world. And the Holy Spirit operated in many ways in the Old Testament. The Spirit was in Joseph, to enable him to interpret dreams and rise to heights of unparalleled wisdom, which changed the course of history. The Spirit filled Bezalel to enable him to produce incredible artistic creations, Exodus 31. The Spirit came upon Balaam in Numbers 24 to prophesy and came upon Othniel and Samson in Judges to lead them to victory. This Holy Spirit stirred Samson to that same end. The Holy Spirit spoke through David in 2 Samuel 23 to prophesy of God's faithfulness. The Spirit rested on Elisha in 2 Kings 2 to endorse him as Elijah's successor. The Spirit entered into Ezekiel and fell upon Ezekiel and lifted Ezekiel up, all in order to deliver the prophetic word. The Spirit came upon Saul and upon David to enable them to govern, 1 Samuel. But when the Spirit departed from Saul, his leadership was over. After his sin in the 51st Psalm, David cried out to God not to take the Holy Spirit away from him. And so that's a panorama of the work of the Holy Spirit from creation and through the Old Testament. And it leads up to this, that God promises that in the last days he is going to pour his Spirit out in a way that has hitherto been unknown. And he speaks in these words through the prophet Ezekiel. I will take you from the nations, Ezekiel 36, and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you should be clean from all of your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and obey my rules. And that theme continues in the next chapter, the 37th chapter, where Ezekiel has this vision of God breathing into these dry bones and causing flesh and sinews to be created on them. And and, uh, Israel is depicted in that vision as, as dead bones resurrected to life. And the prophetic word continues in that chapter, promising that God will place His Spirit within them and restore them to their own land. And there's a remarkable parallel in Ezekiel Uh, in Ezekiel's vision of the Spirit to the original creation account. In the original account, it says, God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. But when we come to Ezekiel, it says that God will take lifeless bones, cause breath to enter them, and they will come to life, and he'll cause his breath to come upon them so that the dead may live. So it's almost like God is prophesying, as there was an original creation, there is a new creation coming. And the significance is 
that Israel's latter days coming to life recapitulates the original creation account of God breathing into Adam and bringing him life. So what's the prophet saying? The prophet is saying that in the future, there is going to be a resurrection of God's people that is going to be an act of new creation, and it's going to be marked by the giving of the Spirit. The creation of humanity, the story of the creation, came to a very sad end, as we know, through the entrance of sin. Adam failed in his commission to extend the garden uh, through being fruitful and multiplying. And then Israel is given a similar commission in Isaiah 49 to be a light to the nations, and Israel failed. And so now an act of new creation is required if the purposes of God in the original creation are going to be fulfilled. And so Ezekiel describes this act of creation in chapter 36 and 37 in two ways. In 36, the washing with water, and in 37, as new creation and resurrection by the Spirit. And it wasn't just Ezekiel, because Isaiah tells us that a Messiah is going to come upon whom the Spirit of the Lord will rest. And when this king comes, he is going to rule in righteousness. In Isaiah 32, the Spirit will be poured out upon all of God's people. Zechariah said, in the last days, the plan of God is going to be accomplished, not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. And then the prophet Joel speaks words which hundreds of years later are quoted by Peter as they come to fulfillment on the day of Pentecost. And he says this, Afterward I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days, and everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. For on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there will be deliverance, as the Lord has said. Now, at the time of Jesus, the Jewish teachers believed that the Holy Spirit, who had anointed the godly men and prophets of old, had departed from Israel with the death of the last prophets of the Old Testament. And as the nation had fallen into sin and disobedience, the Holy Spirit had been withdrawn. And for 400 years, there was no word from God and no presence of the Spirit. But they believed that when the Messiah came, the Spirit would return. And the sign that the Messiah had come would be that the Spirit would rest upon him. The Spirit who had been absent all those centuries would rest upon the Messiah, and that in that moment or in that day, all of God's people would be filled by the Spirit and have their hearts changed. And so they believed that the presence of the Spirit would come just like the manifestation of the presence of God on Mount Sinai in fire and light. And so that was the belief of the Jewish teachers at the time of Jesus. And so John the Baptist, entering into this world as a Jew who knows both the Scriptures and the rabbi's teaching, clearly understood that he was the forerunner of the Messiah. And John describes himself in Isaiah's words as the one appointed to prepare the way for the Messiah to come. And he said, I baptize in water, but the one coming will baptize in the Holy Spirit. The, those words for a Jew could only refer to the Messiah. And then the scripture records in Matthew chapter 3 that the Holy Spirit came down on Jesus at his baptism. This was earth shaking for a people who believed that the Holy Spirit had not shown up for 400 years. And then Jesus goes on in John 7 and promises, uh, not, not only has he received the Spirit, but whoever believes in me is going to receive the infilling of the Spirit. Now, as Jesus ascended into heaven after his resurrection, he gave the disciples the instruction to wait in Jerusalem until they've been clothed with power from on high. And on the 50th day after Passover, the word Pentecost 
uh, comes from the Greek word for 50. On the 50th day after Passover, just as the Jews had expected, the Holy Spirit fell with fire and light. Now, the believers on that day were gathered together in a house. I wonder if it was the same house that had the upper room in it, referred to in Acts chapter 1. Uh, Exodus chapter 19 speaks of the giving of the law on the third new moon. And Pentecost was the festival of the third month in the Jewish calendar. And so it was believed by the Jews to be the day that God gave the law and made a covenant with his people. And so it was a very, very significant day. The whole Jewish faith was built on the concept of the law and the covenant that God had made. And now on that very day, the covenant with God and his people, the covenant between God and his people, is about to be renewed, but in a way the Jewish teachers never, ever expected. Now, Luke makes it clear that the coming of the Spirit was both audible and visible and totally supernatural. The sound of a rushing wind filled the room. Well, that shouldn't surprise us because Genesis describes the Spirit as the ruach or the breath or the wind of God. And immediately the disciples began to speak the praises of God in multiple foreign languages. And as they spoke miraculously in these languages, fire appeared over each of them. Now the fire is significant. The coming of the law was accompanied by fire. God appeared at the burning bush in fire. The people of Israel followed behind the pillar of fire. Fire came to Elijah on Mount Carmel. Fire came from the heavenly altar to the mouth of Isaiah. Fire was on the living creatures who appeared to Ezekiel. This was the baptism in the Holy Spirit that John the Baptist had prophesied, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. The word baptism speaks of a total immersion. Up until now, the Spirit had come upon a select number of people in Old Testament days from time to time, but now all of God's people are being immersed in him. And this immersing was the sign that the Messiah had come and that from now on, God's people would be defined by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Well, these miraculous manifestations immediately drew a crowd. I don't know exactly what happened, uh, maybe the disciples just moved spontaneously out into the streets, or maybe the place where they were was accessible to the public, and they could see the visible signs of what was happening. Uh, whatever be the case, it demonstrates you cannot hide the work of the Holy Spirit. His power, sooner or later, if it's real, is going to break out onto the streets and into the community. And that is a great word to hold on to in these days when God is shaking uh, the security of a world consumed in the idolatry of materialism and the security of technology and medicine. And when those gods fail, it becomes an opportunity for God graciously to remind people of his reality. And it's a great opportunity for the church to return to her first love. And when the church returns to her first love, and when the security of the lost is shaken, and the Holy Spirit comes, then that's a time of revival and awakening. But when the Spirit comes, you can't hide what he's doing. At Pentecost, uh, Jewish and Gentile converts from all over the Roman world uh, gathered together to celebrate the feast in Jerusalem. It was a strategic moment for God to act. And each one of these people from all these different linguistic groups, because Jewish people, even as today, they're scattered across the face of the earth, so were they then scattered across the face of the Roman Empire and had learned different languages of the nations that they uh, were living in, and now each of them hears the praises of God being spoken, and no doubt at the heart of all of that was the good news about Jesus. And uh, according to verse 6, they were astounded 
or astonished. Now, that's really interesting because the same verb, which can also in the Greek language mean confused, is used twice in the Greek translation of Genesis chapter 11. The Greek Old Testament of Genesis chapter 11 refers to the confusion of the tongues at Babel. And now the same verb appears with a twist in the meaning to convey that something very significant is happening. It cannot be an accident that the tongues of Pentecost undid the confusion of the tongues of Babel. And the Jews believed that at Babel, the nations were dispersed to the far corners of the earth under the judgment of God. And so at Pentecost, the message is that God is now reaching out with the message of his kingdom, and he's going to regather all the nations of the world together under the banner of this amazing Messiah. The ungodly unity that God cursed at Babel is about to be replaced by a divine unity that draws people of every nation on earth together in Christ, which is why the Lord cannot return until the gospel of the kingdom has gone forth to every nation. Jesus said that, and when he said nation, the word is ethnos or people group. It's not a political nation, and there are thousands of those groups that have not yet been reached with the gospel message. So the process of unwinding Babel has gone a long way since Pentecost, but it has a way to go yet. Now, the Romans, they loved to list all the nations they'd conquered. They used to put up great monuments in various places. You can see them in Athens or Rome, uh, on other uh, ruins of other places throughout the Roman Empire with uh, uh, statues or ar arches that they put up with a list of the nations they'd conquered. Well, the book of Acts begins in Jerusalem, and it ends in Rome. That's very definite progression, because Jesus said, you'll be my witnesses from Ju Judea, Samaria, and away to the ends of the earth. And the list of nations here runs from east to west. It actually includes people like the Parthians that Rome never conquered. It, it's God's way of putting up a monument with the nations that he's conquered written on it. And the message was very clear. The kingdom of God is going to lay claim to the nations of the world in a way that neither Rome nor any other empire would ever equal. The gospel of the kingdom will go forth to every nation before Jesus returns. Well, the day of Pentecost inaugurated a new age, an age which will extend until the return of Jesus Christ. We are today the people of the Spirit. And it's a tragedy, and I've felt this for almost as long as I've been a Christian, when as Christians we spend more time arguing over the role of the Holy Spirit or His work than we do seeking His power. The Bible speaks of the Father being in heaven and the Son seated at His right hand. Now, that's what we call anthropomorphic language. It speaks of God in human language, and it's obviously not perfect. It's just trying to get at a reality that human language can't fully explain. But it does express an important truth in the sense that God is in heaven and Jesus is in heaven or in the heavenly places, and the Holy Spirit is God on earth. Jesus said that when I go, I will send the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit has been sent out by the Father and by the Son to represent them on earth and empower God's people. And all too often, we limit the Holy Spirit to nothing more than a point of doctrine. We might even catch ourselves referring to the Holy Spirit as it. See, the enemy will do everything he can to marginalize the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is God on earth. And if the enemy has marginalized the work of the Spirit, he has marginalized the work of God. So when we see abuses uh, of the work or the gifts of the Spirit, let's remember one thing. The cure for abuse is not disuse, it's correct use. Folks, we're fighting a supernatural battle. 
We have an enemy who will use every supernatural weapon at his disposal. When he sees believers who are disconnected from the power of the Spirit, he doesn't decide to take a day off or level the playing field by holding off his heavy artillery. Oh, no. He, he says, here's a great advantage to pick these people off. We need, in these days, to seek the power of Pentecost. And Paul says that the very power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in us. That's the power that was released at Pentecost. At Pentecost, the temple of God, or a percentage of it, or a portion of it, fell out of heaven and onto the city of Jerusalem. That's the power of the resurrection. And we need the power of Pentecost to move in the supernatural. Absolutely. But we also need the power of Pentecost to witness for the lost. We need the power of Pentecost to live for Christ. We need the power of Pentecost to do anything for God. If the gifts of the Spirit are supernatural gift from God, so is the fruit of the Spirit. Without Pentecost, I have no power to walk in love, no power to walk in joy, no power to experience humility or integrity or godliness in my life. I need the Holy Spirit, and so do you. There were two groups of people in Jerusalem on that day. One group was watching in wonder and uh, sought out. What, what does this mean? But the others were sitting back and looking on it in scorn and suggesting that the disciples have had too much to drink. Now, we need to be careful that as we watch the moving of the Spirit, we fall into the first group and not the second. We need more of the Spirit, not less. John Wimber, the founder of the Vineyard Movement, made the famous statement that God will offend the mind to change the heart. As it so happens, I'm speaking today from uh, the church uh, congregation, which was uh, used by God to plant out the Toronto Airport Church, where in 1994 the Holy Spirit fell and had a dramatic effect on the nations of the world, including the United Kingdom, an effect that remains to this day. So this was sort of the birthplace, this historic place that I'm speaking from. And uh, during that move of the Spirit and during any move of the Spirit, there is always the option to sit back and criticize because what the Spirit is doing doesn't conform to what our preconceptions are or what our past experience has been or how we think God should operate. Well, let me give you a tip. Let God be God because he knows better how to conduct the affairs of his kingdom than you and I do. Let the Holy Spirit be the Holy Spirit. I will never apologize for the Holy Spirit. Do we need to have order? Yes, we need to have order. But if we have a choice between, as John Arnott always used to say and probably still does, if we have a choice between the order of the nursery, where there's dirty nappies and a little bit of mess around, or the order of the cemetery, I know which one I'm going to take. Where there's no oxen in the stall, there's no mess. When the Holy Spirit breaks out, all sorts of things will happen. Let's take a hold of the life of the Spirit and clean up the mess later. Don't sanitize. We're living in an age of sanit sanitization, and it has to be that way. But don't sanitize the work of God. Allow God to be God. The supernatural is always an offense to the natural mind. Don't despise the work of the Spirit. Seek out what's truly God and pursue that with all your heart. There will always be activity when the Spirit comes, partly because the Spirit won't unearth the work of the enemy. He'll bring new people in with all their baggage and all their problems in order to be dealt with. But we want life. If you want the power of God, then it'll never come the way that you've ordered it to come. If we want the reality of the kingdom, 
there will always be mess, just as there is when a baby's born, but there will also be life. And that's what we want, isn't it? It's comfortable to stay in our little church services, but when the lost come in, which is what we're praying for, let me tell you, it'll be a mess. I got saved in the Jesus movement, and our church was a comfortable little church, about 125 or 150 people. And within months, because we had a spirit-anointed pastor who was a great evangelist, within months the congregation grew from 150 to 1,000. Uh, and that was a problem, because young people were coming in, they weren't dressed the right way, the music changed, it wasn't what people had been used to, and there were a lot of people who were offended, but there was life. And the Holy Spirit may not affect our church or even ourselves the way that we would like Him to. When I first got touched back in that visitation of God 25 plus years ago, uh, I found myself trying to preach and falling on the floor. It was embarrassing. In my mind, I was fighting it. What God was in my mind, I was fighting what God was doing in my heart. Uh, you don't go to seminary and get several degrees in theology to wind up unable to preach because you're lying on the floor with everybody laughing at you. But see, God was dealing with pride in my heart. And today, if God comes again, it probably won't look like the last time. I really don't care what it looks like. I want God to come, and I want more of His Spirit, whether it's on this day of Pentecost or any other day of the year. Friends, brothers and sisters, seek the Holy Spirit. Seek Him actively. Seek His work in your life. Without a personal Pentecost, you have nothing. You can't rely on Mike's Pentecost or the Elder's Pentecost or uh, P.J. Smythe's Pentecost or uh, other great apostolic and prophetic leaders' Pentecost to drip down on you. You need a personal Pentecost. God has made His Spirit available to every single one of you. It doesn't matter in the end how He comes to you or in what order He does things in you or what gifts of the Spirit you do or don't experience. It, it doesn't matter what He's doing in you compared to what He's doing in the person sitting beside you. It just matters that He's doing something. And as for me, I'll take everything that He wants to give me in order to do what He wants me to do in my life. I won't turn away. I won't dishonor Him. I won't apologize for His work because without the Holy Spirit, God on earth, I have nothing and neither do you. Every day, is a new opportunity to say, Holy Spirit, come. Now, Father, we thank you for your word today. I pray for my brothers and sisters at Cornerstone and anyone else who winds up watching this. I pray, Father, that you would send your Holy Spirit in a fresh way to each of us. And as things unfold in weeks and months to come, that empowered by the Spirit, we would see Pentecostal outpourings. Lord, we, we want to see Pentecost come to Newcastle upon time. We want to see Pentecost come to the northeast of England. We want to see Pentecost come to the United Kingdom. We want to see Pentecost come to this needy world. And Lord, we want to be part of it. We don't want to be those that look back and despise it or disagree or are analyzing and so busy analyzing that we can't experience the Spirit of God in our midst. We don't want to be like the Jews that day, that when the Messiah came, they missed Him entirely. Lord, we want to be those who are sensitive to You. We want to be those who are actively seeking more of You. And we know, Lord that you will not turn aside anyone who comes seeking to be filled with the Spirit. And we know also, Lord, according to Ephesians 5, 
that we're commanded to be continually refilled. We can't rely on yesterday's or 10 years ago experience of the Spirit. We need to be refilled today to live for Christ, to have the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, to have the gift of the Spirit manifest in our service to Him. So Holy Spirit, You are God, and we are at Your service. We place ourselves at Your disposal today, and we say, please come. Amen.
to flame A passion for your name Spirit of God Come have your way Lord have your way Lord have your way Lord have your way Lord have your way Thank you, Jesus, that there is no wall you cannot move, no thing you cannot change for the good and the glory of your kingdom. We pray that you would use us in the week to come, you would fill us with your spirit, and you would give us ample opportunities to show the world how incredible you are. Amen. There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. What do you think? Oh. E no, Johnny! Johnny's hair keeps falling off. Do it, Johnny. <gasps> We've lost Johnny. <laughs> Twelve seconds later. Oh, whatever. Whatever. Why don't cover him up? Previously on Cornerstone Church Online. <laughs> well, when we pray, we ask. See why my video is taking so long. <laughs> um, let's go to the, the cut of picture <laughs> art child asking. Okay. Yeah. Ready? Hang on. in the garden, at school, or even in the car. Morning, afternoon, night. It makes no difference. That's amazing! Awesome! I... <laughs> um... I think we need to go back up. Oh no! No! no. Oh my gosh. To go up to. Oh no. Hop. I bet you could.
to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Come like fire in the winter. Come like water in the desert.
There's nothing worth more that could ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves, where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone.
to be overcome by your presence, Lord. Come like fire in the winter. Come like water in the desert. i 